So welcome to our podcast, Business with a Social Purpose, by Alison Belshaw for the School for Social Entrepreneurs. I'm sat here in a beautiful garden in Bath uh, at Fairfield House um, with Ras Benji, who is from Fairfield House and one of the students on the programme at the moment, and with Susan Moores, who's an uh, entrepreneurship facilitator um, and leading the course. And we're just going to find out a little bit more about what um, Fairfield House is and also how the programme's been going. So, ra- welcome Ras Benji, nice Hi, to Alison. see you, and um, can you just tell me a little bit about what you've been, what Fairfield House is and your role within it? So Fairfield House is home to His Imperial Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie I from the years of 1936 to 1940, and his family members, other members of the Ethiopian royal family and government lived here even up to 1943 and the emperor gave his house to the city of Bath for the good of their elderly in 1958 and since the 90s it's been used for exactly that purpose even before then it was used for that purpose but as a residential care home but since the 90s it's been used as a day centre for Bath's ethnic minority elderly senior citizens Um, And in recent years, there's been a museum and other things developed at Fairfield House for people that are very interested in the legacy. So it's very much a community place, but it's in a heritage building with a very strong historical narrative attached. So one of the recent things that we've been embarking on is opening to the public. That sounds fantastic and what an incredible history for Bath. Um, Can I just ask you what... um, in terms of the programme that you're on with SSE, what encouraged you to apply for it um, and what difference did you think it might help you make and you know, following on from that, what has it actually helped you to do? Yeah, so for me, um, being involved in a social enterprise, in a CIC, was a new experience anyway. Um, I'm kind of finding my way in that. So it's been nice to be in that learning environment to kind of find out the different things of what it's been about, to hear from other people that have been in that experience. So that's been very valuable for me. Um, I guess just like, because I've been giving a lot to Fairford House as a volunteer also, um, the SSE programme and the support that I've been given has kind of made this focus target of increasing our income, which has also sustained a role, which has been very important. So for a few days a week, I'm specifically now working on um, income generation tasks for Fairfield House, which is I've really enjoyed and has been really successful. Um, hopefully will become a sustainable thing. And are you able to um, give us an indication of how much you've managed to increase the income by, or is that something? Uh, um, I, w- I wouldn't like to quote the specific <laughs> numbers, but I, I think we, we have done enough to gain the match funding, which is fantastic. Fantastic, that's really good yeah. to hear. And you said something there about um, learning from others who are on the course as well. What uh, do you think some of those might develop into longer term relationships with some of those organisations? Well. From hearing from the experts was very valuable because those are really the people that you're looking up to is to say, well, our social enterprise could grow to be something like that in a few years' time. So that was that was like a look into the future. But also with the other people on the accelerator course, just networking amongst ourselves, it's been nice to make so many local connections. And an example of that, the representative from Grow for Life, a local charity um, that they deal with horticultural therapeutic gardening. And we were in a conversation at the residential at SSE and they said, oh, we need places to take people for gardening. And I said, well, I've got a historic building with a big garden and I'm doing a lot of the gardening myself, so we actually need help. So since the time of being on that residential, Grow for Life have actually been here to Fairford House and helped out for a whole day and brought about 12 people. And they're now going to do that every few months, which is fantastic. You know, just in that is a great result for me because it like lightens the load and for them to bring knowledgeable people that are willing to help out for the day and had such a good time at Fairford House in the garden that they asked to come back. So it's just like a win-win on both sides, I think.
That's absolutely incredible. Those are exactly the stories I love to hear about connections that are made and things that can that work out and people you might not have met just generally otherwise um, or you would have had to work perhaps work harder to build the relationship with but you've got a really fantastic solution there for both of your organizations yeah so that, that that's really exciting I'm just going to go to Susan for a minute and and ask you Susan your um, Ras Benji is on the uh, accelerator program but you're the facilitator for the startup uh, program can you tell me a little bit about your role and yeah uh, what you're finding so so startup and accelerator it's really important that people know the difference so startup will be um, a time and a place when people are really getting going with a new idea or they might have been around for a while but they haven't yet incorporated and, and got their legal structure and I'm just going to just let you know that this is actually quite exciting for the School of Social Entrepreneurs that this is the first time they've ever put a match trade in grant. So my role with that has been holding the space, as I call it, as a facilitator so that people um, arrive to a learning programme with an idea of what they might want or for some people with no idea of what they might want and putting several subjects and topics together that are all related to developing a business that has a social purpose. So we often start on our programs at SSE with where am I in the world and where do I want to be in the world, but also not just where am I in the world, but why do I care passionately about this thing, facility, product that I actually want to make, create and deliver to the world. And I think that for me is the, the really big difference between social purpose businesses and traditional businesses that sometimes traditional businesses are about how much money can you make so that you can carry on making more of it whereas it feels to me that what we do is how can you make money but also how can you really make a real difference in the world and what what I love about my role is watching people on that journey and have you had any um, similar sort of links uh, do you think made between uh, the organizations that are on startup uh, that you can see developing into the future? So uh, from what I understand, a couple of the organisations are actually going to trade with each other because of the services or expertise that they've got. Um, links, not just amongst the cohort, but links with the, um, the group that, that we're going to talk to later, 3SG. So 3SG's individual day learning programmes, people from our programs have gone to them and made links that have led to commissions and contracts I've just learned even about that this morning so I think one of the bigger things that the whole program has done is link people into departments and individuals within the local authority which is really useful as well as into that wider voluntary sector support um, while we're talking I will carry on thinking because there are some specific links but I'd like to give you a real example actually rather than just yeah, that, that's really good though because that, that means you know people are building up their longer term relationships with organisations that can sometimes be quite difficult for them to get into and um, what I particularly like what you've picked up there is the um, businesses with a social purpose trading with each other you know if, you, if you're a social enterprise then it's great to buy from another social enterprise or find a way of working with them so that's, that's fantastic, thank you so it sounds like a really exciting time for Fairfield House and you, um, we talked a little bit earlier about open days that you have. Um, do you want to say a little bit about those and also what other things you see going forward um, that, have, that this programme with SSE has helped you to think more clearly about? So we trialled opening to the public. Um, Fairfield House had never been regularly open to the public before. Um, we trialled it in October for Black History Month and we opened on Sundays, but we hadn't relaunched this until the, until during the SSD programme because we had that support and extra money to invest into things that we needed for the tour and someone, myself, to actually work on, on that um, launch and to um, facilitate kind of the, the operations of it actually going on each week and to coordinate volunteers and so forth. And we're still building up, but it's been an absolutely brilliant success. And I think it's really 
is starting small, but word is getting out there now that Fairfield House is on open on a Sunday, and you can come and hear the historical story of what happened here with the emperor and his family. And afterwards, you can have a nice Caribbean lunch as well on a Sunday. So it's um, I think just that alone is 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 bringing people in. But it's been very very good for the house, and we we want that to continue. We want to be open every Sunday because it really fulfills a need. Because on a normal day like today, you could get people just come along and they say, "Oh, I love Harry Slassy," or "I'm really interested. I really want to come in." But we would have the elders in or vulnerable users of the house, so we couldn't just have the public coming in and out. So we had to have a particular day. So at the moment, that Sunday is for our public opening. Um, but with more kind of counselling with the in the SSE thing, talking about how I can take this forward even more, and um, we started talking about business to business because public opening that's business to consumer what we're doing there. But if we were to do business to business, so we looked at other organisations, maybe schools or businesses on away days or um, other organisations that would like to have a private experience of of this, then we have another couple of days to play with in the week, and that's where I would be looking into the future for Fairfield House for us to be have more availability for people to visit in harmony with the other things that are going on in the house, which would be very important. I think the school's visits could be a very interesting um, way forward. Do you have um, a sort of timetable for trialling something or are you going to put the full programme in place straight So away? we're discussing it now. Obviously the tour has been developed so we do have a very good product to offer the schools and, it, and the people that have, have been on the tour that were GCSE students in particular, they said this is fantastic because they're studying what they call the Abyssinia crisis which is about Ethiopia in 1935 so this house is is very very relevant possibly the best place in the world Mm. to go um, if you're studying that subject so we're going to be targeting that and we're just kind of in discussions now um, for later in the year black history month to possibly invite in more schools to come and visit fairfield house because those hopefully will become long-term relationships where that school decides to bring their students every year and equally there's lots of other organisations that might want to bring um, people along so recently we had um, Royal United Hospital, their staff away day, they did a tour and lunch at Fairfield House Um, and we've had the the Baines Carer Centre as well have also enjoyed a a tour so there could be more organisations that it appeals to also. Definitely, I think that's great and may and perhaps linking as well with 3SG who are based here with the community organisations they're working with to ra- help them raise the profile uh, that that's available here for people to come to. Yeah, you know, 3SG do a great job um, anyway. Yes, Fairfield absolutely. And, um, I think they're quite happy here at the moment, which is brilliant. And they have a really good reputation with local authorities and so forth. Yeah. So it's, it's very good for the house for them to be here. Yeah, it's yeah great it, it, it was really making me think when you were talking about when, when the emperor gave this gift, whether there would have been any realisation about how wide that gift would spread because the way that you've worked here has gone far wider than the original offer and and then and I just really want to say this for those people that are listening where the kind of business with a social purpose is new so a couple of times during the conversation we said CIC haven't we mm. and for some people they won't know that means a community interest company yes. and it's a particular type of legal structure to, so that we can do good business in the community so just wanted to throw that in because I bet that was something the Emperor didn't realise that he was doing when well, he gifted he, it. Well, he, gave, he expressly gave Fairfield House um, to the Corporation of Bath and the citizens of Bath for, for the use of the elderly, for the, for the good of the elderly. Um, and that is still the primary purpose of Fairfield House today. And that's for, the, for us as Fairfield House Bath CIC to make sure that Bath ethnic minority senior citizens that they're as strong as they can possibly be and the elders are as happy as they can possibly be to stay true to that original gift is very important. I see that there's very two there's two really strong narratives here at Fairford House and that's the elderly, the gift, and then the legacy because mm-hmm. Haile Selassie is such an important international figure but locally the story does so much as well because you have 
a refugee situation where the Ethiopian refugees were supported and the local people of Bath really rose up to help them. Um, obviously a racial situation as well where many people hadn't seen a black person in that time, let alone the emperor of Ethiopia. But he had most of the people on his side as a symbol of anti-fascism, fighting against fascism. So that was a very positive story that's, that's here in the city of Bath and a great source of in inspiration for many people that are going through really difficult and troubled times because the emperor saw it all while he was here mm. and it was very, it was very mm. difficult. But And spreading that out in your talking about the school's visits, it, that isn't anything, that's not mutually exclusive to a, to supporting the elder community because we all become elders and also if we move our elders away into into spaces where they're not seen what we're doing is we're separating out society and so I think what you're doing is building like a real inclusive practice on top of the the, 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 the way that it was gifted and it's it is just wonderful to sit here in the garden yeah. and hear this isn't yes. it yes and the table tennis tables are out today um, because Headway or another one of our community business users they're doing a tournament for um, their clients of their organization but very recently we had a Fairfield House table tennis tournament and all, because the emperor used to play here at the house and all our communities came out on that day, representatives of all our communities and there's an elderly man that lives in Empress Menin Gardens and he came into Fairfield House and he threw down his walking sticks and started playing ping pong and everything and um, just, just like something like that to see the new activities um, that we've been up to recently or the elders have been up to in the elderly service is so good and it's been connecting the, the all across all ages. Definitely and, and and by doing what you're doing you know and opening this up to schools and other visitors you know you're you're getting the, those people to mix exactly like you said Susan so mm. that yeah fantastic it's really really exciting and I think I've said that before but I do feel excited about the prospects here for you in terms of um, really making this a very visible uh, space um, and it's an important space for Bath and nationally and internationally frankly. Um, I've also, as we're sitting here, I've just looked to my side and I can see a stained glass window which I didn't notice when we were inside the building before but <laughs> yeah so some amazing little things um, on this fantastic historic building. Yeah, I would recommend people to visit Fairford House, of course, on, on a Sunday. Um, but I would also recommend anyone that's interested to, to join up and go on the SSE programme because it's been very beneficial. Oh, I'm really glad to hear that. That's fantastic. Susan, did you have anything else that you wanted to add from what you've learnt through your through uh, running a course? I, I, would, I wouldn't mind sort of talking a little bit about... Um, Rath Benji mentioned narrative earlier and it, it's the, the, the power of the story on our learning programmes and um, I just wondered if it would be worth mentioning a few of the witness sessions that we have so when witnesses come on the learning programmes what we find every time we run a programme is the students or participants on the programmes will often tell us a year or two later that the, the thing that sticks the most mm. are the stories of the others. Yes. So is it alright to yes, mention please. a few of them? So we've yeah. had between Accelerator and um, Startup. We've had Plymouth Scrap Store. We've had Thought Box Education, Memory Matters, Row Row Ride On Ride Off, Inclusive Wellness, the Suicide Prevention Collective, Unique Voice, Bike Space, A and K's Playground, uh, Love Well, and some others that I can't even read my own handwriting. But anyway, I want <laughs> to give all of them, all of them, and the many others that have contributed a shout out. And one of the things that's quite joyous about talking to you about that is that the it comes around from SSE, so we pay social enterprises to come back yes. and be witnesses on future programmes. So we actually like to think that we help a little bit yeah. on social enterprise development in terms of their trade and really thinking about diversifying income. So that's one of the subjects we cover. So I just thought it'd be useful for people to just know the sort of areas that we cover because you've just mentioned and encouraging people to come on our programme. So we will look at things like your vision and values, we'll look at business business modelling for social purpose and why that might be slightly different than for traditional business. We look at your social impact and, and how people can record the real meaningful differences that they're making. We look at uh, the importance of self-care within looking after others and looking out for others. We will 
have a really big overview about legal structures and thinking about the one that's appropriate for your business. We look at finances, publicity and marketing, and what I know has happened for many of the startup students, because I've just been recently doing their one-to-ones, I'd, I'd like to just talk a little bit about some of the things they've gained from the programme. So individuals have told me that they feel more motivated to actually put the energy into their business. So a lot of people are doing this as what some people would call a side hustle or an, a bit of extra on top mm. of the day job. Some people have got four day jobs mm. and they're still passionate about their their gardening or their, um, their caring for others or their forest schools or designing a, 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 an app so that you can count your, your carbon impact. And we've got this whole range on our programme. We've had people reporting increased confidence and validation as a result of knowing how to speak about what they're doing. They're able to walk into shared spaces, highlight who they need to talk to and go and make those contacts, which have resulted in these commissions and contracts that I was talking about earlier. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, for me, it's all of that. So it's the practical stuff and the practical topic-based learning that people get. But actually what I keep witnessing time and time again is it's the way you arrive with your open mindset mm. and also realize that each person in the room could be a resource to you and you can be a resource to others. And I don't mean that in a kind of um, conventional business way, but just more about what's the human to human that's bigger than if you just stayed it alone. Definitely. I mean, I think what you've you've said a number of things that have sort of resonated with me there. I mean, I I've actually, as well as um, the role I've currently been doing with SSE, uh, I've also been a participant on the Community Business Trade Up program, um, and that I found just so incredibly helpful. And uh, and I actually sat at the first session thinking. I'd really like to deliver this course and a year later that's exactly what I was doing and and <laughs> so so I've had a little my own little story with 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 SSE and the thing that uh, really makes me passionate about it is that is those connections that you were saying Ras Benji about another group coming and doing gardening here what you've uh, just mentioned Susan about the different organisations who've come and given witness sessions, um, some of whom I know, some I don't, um, but the range, the absolute range of social enterprises and people who want to make a difference with their business for a social purpose is quite staggering and um, and something that we should, really, I think we should all be working towards. Absolutely, and if, if I can just say, just to help with a bit more promotion for the School for Social Entrepreneurs is, what I think is amazing is that I learned, because one of one of the witnesses that I use in some, some South Bristol work I'm doing, is actually, she, she came on a programme 11 years ago, when the programmes were 40 days, and you had to pay for it yourself. I think it's really important to let people know through this that we've got a huge team of people behind the scenes who are partnering, collaborating, finding funding so that the courses are free to those who, who come on them. They're competitive to get on because people want to get on a learning programme with a grant and you don't just get the match trading grant, you have to work for it and I'm sure you would agree, I'm looking at Raz now as I speak, I know we're on, a, on an audio but yeah, you have to work for it but that working for it is part of that journey yes. about yes you come on a learning programme but you don't just get a certificate at the end of it, what you get is a whole opportunity to take a journey that might actually not be the the pathway or the set of branches that you imagine but actually may well take you somewhere else that's still hugely beneficial and i'm noticing you're nodding there as well alison which am. obviously and also I, I i think what's what's striking me there as well is that fundamental thing about you are a business with a social purpose but it's okay to earn money it's mm. all right. Mm. It's the, it, it, you're not there for a charitable reason. You are there to trade, and that's okay. And sometimes people have difficulty with that. Or you um, can choose to trade to support your charitable exactly, delivery. Exactly. And I think that model is, is becoming more and more 
well known so people will know things like you might go to a cafe these days and you pay it forward yes you can pay it forward for theater tickets yeah. now you could probably pay it forward for a um a visit to um to fairfield house i'm sure <laughs> one day but who knows so we pull forward experts and witnesses on SSE programs that don't necessarily resonate for each one of those 10, 15 or 20 participants. But I think there's something also about entering the learning space with a mindset that's not just about openness to what, what might be there for your business, but actually this is a collective learning space. So I get from day one and then the person next to me gets the most from day four, but I don't really find anything on day four, but that's okay because you found something on day one. And actually, you never know what day four might mean in two years' time. Yeah. And I really think that's really important to talk about with SSE programs. It's not a conventional learning space. So we're not talking about conventional business and we're not talking about conventional learning. And I think you just highlighted that with your example of the action learning sets. And, and another thing that people get is the kind of one-to-one. -one. And for some people, a group learning experience isn't the best for them. So the one-to-one -one gives that a bit of balance. And also we have this other additional um, offer that I know Alison really loves called the business review panels and they may or may not be the right name. For people that have not heard of that, it's like a bit of a group coaching session that really focuses on your particular needs and challenges. And I've probably been around 20, 25 of those and possibly one hasn't worked at all, but everybody, everybody else got something and it's dramatic quite often what people get from that very focused bit of time on them and their business. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. And um, yeah, I, yes, I've been a sort of business advisor on some of those panels and just um, that space uh, for the person from the organisation to have and have a look, some advisors and you say it's partly about coaching but it also is about the ability within those to give some advice and just drop little seeds of things that that you know the the person on the panel might not have thought about and I love watching those sort of um you know the minds whirring and, and loads of notes being written mm. and, and it doesn't mean moments. yes and it doesn't mean that everything has to be action there and then uh, likewise the learning from the course it's long term you know and a lot of it like you were saying Susan something that was relevant on one day might not be relevant until five years later mm. but actually you've still learned that and you know you've got it there um, to, mm. to support you I yeah there's something very unique about the learning and the courses and I, it's fantastic that's Benji to hear about the you know what you've got from it yeah and also from you Susan about the um I can tell your, you know, your enthusiasm for it and, and, and wanting to deliver it and hear about um, all of those, you know, bring together those people to uh, develop the learning of others. So we've been joined by Jim now, who's from Market Reach, and he's on the Startup Programme. Jim, I'd just like to ask you to sort of introduce yourself and what you're trying to do with your social enterprise. Sure. Well, my name is Jim Okogu, and my social enterprise is a two-parter. One is a digital agency named Market Reach, where I am building websites for various uh, customers and looking to branch out into providing other digital marketing services along the lines of you know lead generation and things like that but still early stages but so far building websites and the second part is to use part of those profits to fund poetry workshops for various people i've been asked by bemsko first of all to do a poetry workshop for some of the staff and then going forward i'd like to spread that out to to more people Great. That's the basics. <laughs> so, great. So, so essentially, um, the websites and the income from that, you want to use the income to support your, your the poetry the and poetry, poetry workshops. workshops. That was the original idea, yeah, yes. Great. Okay. And so, in terms of the program itself, how have you found that? What have you learnt from it? Has it changed your mind about anything? giving you firmer ideas about what you want to achieve? Well, I've found the program to be very helpful. Um, various things. One is meeting all the other people on the program, being able to exchange ideas and see where people are coming from. 
and of course the people who are leading the various uh, workshops and so on and so forth their experience has been very valuable in terms of uh, how it's affected my ideas definitely a few things have evolved over time one is how my idea of who I was going to market the websites to that is slowly evolving to be able to spread out into more niches than I thought uh, so it's just given me a wider scope of people to reach out to in terms of the business side of things in order to make that uh, profit. And in terms of the poetry workshops, um, that's another thing that uh, I've gained a bit of confidence in just the idea that I could use that also as an income generation source rather than merely as the, you know, something funded by the other right. things. So I'm trying to work out how that will work out now, but it's given me a bit of confidence with it. I sh yeah, I mean... Well, that sounds fantastic, because it's helped you to recognise that there's there are other ways of bringing in money, and, and also through the part that you're particularly passionate about and, and that you really want to do. Um, is there one specific takeaway that you've got from from what you've either what you've learned or what you're going to do? Ooh. Hard to distill it all there. into one <laughs> phrase, I guess. I don't know. Um, well, be confident in your abilities, but also don't be arrogant. So don't try and take on everything and do too much. Uh, be able to reach out to other people to help you out when uh, to make, you know, form partnerships or, you know, to outsource some of the work. But yeah, that, finding that balance where. Yeah, being confident that you can actually do what you are trying to do, but without being arrogant and thinking you can do it all, I think that might be a good <laughs> I think balance. Those, I think you've just given a couple of absolutely fantastic bits of advice there. One is about not taking on too much, thinking that you can do it all, mm -hmm. because, but actually putting in some steps to do things you can achieve so you can feel great about that mm. before you know the bigger plan and the bigger picture sure. um so so i just think that's amazing and um yes being confident and uh you know know, know where you want to get to mm -hmm. so that's yeah. brilliant well, okay thanks. thank you for joining us today my pleasure thank you We've now been joined in this lovely garden by uh, Becky Brooks, who's the new director of 3SG, the Voluntary Sector Support Group. And um, we're just going to ask her a few questions about it, what it's been like for her, although we have to be fair to her because she's only been here six weeks and we've been running the programme for a little bit longer than that. Becky, would you like to tell us about um, your role and what you're finding about the voluntary sector in Bath and North East Somerset and a little bit about your plans for the future. Yeah, thanks Alison. So yeah, I'm Becky, I'm the new director at 3SG. Um, it's been a really big learning curve for me because I've come from sort of media and communications rather than the third sector. So I've been sort of learning a lot about how it all works. And um, But I've brought all my contacts and all my experience over from, from where I was and in, into this. And, you know, quite a few people I've I've worked with for a very long time in this sector anyway in my previous capacity um, so for me it's just been a lot of learning um, and finding out about all the amazing work that 3SG do um, in the community and, and to help support um, the brilliant charities that exist um, in the area and there are many of them and they're all doing incredible things so I've spent a long time meeting people and working out what everybody does and, and how we can help. Um, so that's what I've been doing so far and obviously taking part in a lot of events that we've been running through the SSE um, workshops and they've been a really great way for me to meet lots of people in one go as well. Yeah, so we've had a fantastic range of events on all sorts of things, uh, social media workshops, funding workshops, um, oh, how yeah. to be a social entrepreneur, yeah, there have been a whole tonight. range yeah. of them which has been incredible and they've been very well supported I think. Yeah, um, absolutely, really well. good attendance, yeah, yeah. we've got um, Michelin star Josh Eggleton with us tonight, Michelin star chef, um, so that'll be really great to have him along and and uh, I'm going to interview him later, so I'm going to put some of my old skills to the test um, in this new role, so that'll be fun. And then how do you see, um, it's probably far too early to tell you, <laughs> to answer <laughs> this one, but, you know, the future for 3SG, what, what, do, what do you um, want it to be in terms of its 
you're supporting the voluntary and community yeah sector. I mean I think 3SG has an amazing future ahead of it and it's moving into a new phase after the incredible work it did at the race course and with the vaccination and compassionate communities effort I mean that was really incredible and and uh, you know full kudos to everyone who was involved with that it's just been amazing all the brilliant volunteers as well um, so we're sort of moving into a new phase in terms of um, how we can support people locally in our charities and our members um, and it's working out what comes next and some of my key priorities I think are going to be cost of living um, the crisis that's kind of tsunamiing its way towards us um, and also mental health as part of that like to do a lot in terms of diversity and inclusion um, and also um, resettling the work that's happening with resettling refugees so trying to really help people feel involved in the communities that they now live in and sort of integrating people into society to make them feel that that you know they really should deservedly you know belong here and, and feel yeah. comfortable in, in those communities so I think those are sort of our key priorities and obviously supporting our members t to do those things you know there's already people doing incredible work in in those areas so i'm really excited i'm really excited there's lots to do lots to be getting on with lots of big projects <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds fantastic and like you're going to be busy and i'm yeah. really really grateful that you could just come and speak to us for a few minutes to to let us know that and i you know hope that the um that you continue to build the profile of 3sg in the area and that it supports the really important sector thank so thank you. you we will thank you so i'm here now with miles lloyd from 3sg who's going to tell us a little bit about 3sg's role in this project in bath and north east somerset yeah thanks alison so yeah i'm miles and i'm the project manager of 3sg and 3sg stands for bath and north east somerset third sector group our role is really to bring together the over 180 charities, community groups and social enterprises um, that we have across Bath and North East Somerset in our membership um, and also look to expand that network. Really, my, my role in the project has been making sure that we're able to run the events as effectively as possible. These have been in person and online workshops, trainings um, networking events all part of the programme. So we've ran over 20 in total, ranging from sessions on GDPR training to um, fundraising, a massive charity conference where we had over 500 signups. So it's been a real varied range of series of events and, and really my role has been um, ensuring that they, they take place smoothly as well as doing some of the back end data sorting and uh, <laughs> communicating and doing a few one-to-ones and and everything else so it's been yeah it's been a great project to get involved with and have you got any uh, sort of interesting stories that have come out of that have you seen a an increase in the membership of 3sg for example and have you has there been you know what sort of feedback have you had from the workshops that you've run yeah there's been so much learning um from both sides actually so um yeah we've definitely seen an increase in our membership growth We've been able to bring on board uh, a number of consultants um, to actually support with this project um, and having SSE as partners and has been brilliant in terms of sort of growing our reach. So, yeah, we've had over 20 percent membership um, growth since we started this program. So we're around 150 members. Um, and now we're well over 180 members since we uh, started. So that's been really great. And also, yeah, there's in terms of the actual workshops and events themselves, I think some of the biggest learning has been around actually whether people like in person or online um, and how that's kind of fluctuated. And so as we're still moving on from COVID, um, we're still trying to get a better understanding of where what the needs are in terms of the charities and social enterprises we're working with and those volunteers and employees that we're trying to reach out to. And so for some of the workshops, we've had an attendance rate of over 50 and then others, we've had a very low attendance rate of sort of five to 10. And it's sort of working out some of the reasons why that is. And, and it is very hard to predict. But um, and also the, the online events does, you know, there is a real benefit to them in terms of being able to reach a wider audience. But the in-person events have an additional benefit of that sort of that networking that every single one of those in-person events that we've held, it's not only been beneficial just for the event topic itself and the session outcomes, but the additional bonus of them being able to share learning 
and relate to other participants on the course, which is very hard to get out of an online event in a sort of natural setting. So, yeah, I think that's just a few. I mean, I could go on for hours <laughs> about a lot of the learnings. I think that's really helpful. And, and I think that's certainly something that SSE has found as well. So the online learning has been great for everybody, but actually getting them together in, uh, on, on the residentials has really made a difference in terms of people understanding who the other participants are and potentially even working with them in the future so you know it, it, and it's very very hard to do that over zoom so um so that's fantastic and then just in terms of 3sg's plans for the future how do you do you have anything specific as your next project or uh, how are you looking to develop the sector even more within bath and north east somerset yeah, that's a really good question, actually. And it's something which is very exciting because there's a lot that we can build from off the back of this project. So we've, after getting a lot of the feedback from participants in the, if, uh, and attendees from the, the project, there's clearly a need for us to run more of these types of events, but also look to offer potentially more one-to-one -one support for our members um, and the wider third sector, uh, as well as actually there's been a lot of partnerships and a lot of organizations that we weren't necessarily working with as closely um, that we can look to sort of run joint events with so they might be sort of companies like we've been working with clearly pr um on the sort of on the communications and marketing workshops we've we've been working with like sort of core insights on the gdpr there's been several companies uh, as well as um organizations that we've been working with and i think it's just for us, it's looking to sort of see what we can, what, what we can deliver more in terms of our services, but also look to collaborate more with organisations that are out there already doing either similar sorts of work or maybe be able to harness what we're already doing. So that's going to be a real core focus for us. It's just continue to do what we're doing, but also we really want to try and reach more of the third sector locally. So whilst we have over 180 members at the moment, we'd really like that to grow because we know that there's a lot more we can definitely offer to social enterprises, charities and community groups that are out there that aren't part of the network already. So, yeah, if there's any um, groups out there that would be interested in, in joining 3SG, then do, do let us know because we're always looking to see how we can help and bring together the sector. That's fantastic and really good news to hear. And I think for, from SSE's point of view, it's been great partnering with 3SG and, um, you know, really being able to develop this project. There hasn't been anything like this in Bath and North East Somerset before. This is the first time. So it's actually been really very exciting and uh, really useful to work with um, such a committed partner. So I'm glad to hear that everything's been positive. <laughs> Hard work, but positive. <laughs> <laughs> So that's fantastic. Okay, that's lovely, Miles. Thank you very much indeed for speaking us, to us today and um, good luck with the future of 3SG. Yeah, thank you very much, Alison. So I'm now here with Sunil, who's uh, one of the facilitators on the uh, Accelerator course, um, who's going to tell us a little bit about his experience with the social entrepreneurs he's working with. Hello, Alison. So my name is uh, Sunil O'Broy and I am the um, facilitator for the um, Baines cohort uh, under the CRF program. So my background being, you know, coming as, as an entrepreneur and as an investor and advisor uh, for a lot of entrepreneurs, this sort of uh, program, you know, to me was excellent. It had all the, the great things for the learners. For example, we had... Uh, uh, you know, a lot of networking options. We had a lot of uh, group activities. We had um, several experts or witness sessions running for the students or the learners. I think they all got a lot out of it. I heard about all of it during their one-on-ones and, uh, you know, general catch-ups that I've been doing with the learners. And uh, and I think it, uh, it was just fantastic uh, in terms of... Um, uh, you know, the sort of exposure we as SSC has provided them. Um, uh, I, I just look forward to do more of this uh, as we as we move forward. Sounds great. And how about um, the mix of uh, online learning and um, in person at the residentials? Do you think that that's worked for everybody or are there any 
sort of tips you'd give? So I think the the mix of um, online and offline you know sessions were quite good, but I think uh, the sort of world we live in nowadays, there is uh, a lot more we can do in terms of uh, the sort of online or digital support we can provide to the entrepreneurs. So this time we mostly live online sessions brought people together, which are great. You know, you get good participation, you know, it's comfortable, people can do it from, from their homes. Uh, but there are a few more things we can do in that area where we can have, let's say, a virtual learning environment. We can, uh, you know, sort of have a lot of recorded sessions, recorded bits that people can, you know, review in their own time because everyone may have a different speed of learning. Uh, and you really can't, uh, you know, deal with that when you're running the the live sessions because you have to finish things in a certain amount of time and there is a limited time to do Q&A. But if there is a sort of a virtual learning environment where we can have, you know, loaded content beforehand that people can actually look at in their own times and then they, uh, uh, you know, come back with questions based on that after a week or two, where the facilitator can go in and uh, you know bring them in a group and then have discussions around the topics that they should have looked at before. I think those are a few bits we can add. Uh, offline stuff, I think it's great. You know, we are obviously running the speed networking bits in the upcoming residentials. We did other networking pieces before, and when we look at the feedback from learners, they really enjoyed those bits. So online and offline learning is extremely critical, and uh, I think we have done great on the the offline side of things, but th- there, are, there, are, there are more things which we can do, I think, on the online front. Yeah, that sounds very good. I think um, it's it's learning for everybody, really, isn't it? SSE, <laughs> um, in terms of how it runs things in the future. Um, so that's very, very helpful feedback. Um, I just wondered if you had one thing that really sticks out for you in terms of the organisations that your work you work with, whether you've seen one particularly develop in a certain way over the course of the programme or change direction even, or um, if a partnership of any sort has developed that's been interesting? I think I've seen a different level of uh, improvements in people in terms of their confidence, for example, you know, their familiarity with business concepts, um, their, uh, you know, thought process, as it has developed over uh, the last several months in terms of how they should be looking at the charity as a whole or a business as a whole. How can they think a bit more about trading, Um, which many of them have never done before because they have been living on grants, uh, very much like the SSE profile itself. So that's where I think a lot of improvement has come in people's mind in terms of developments i can i can definitely say that many of the cohort members are now interacting with each other engage with each other i know several of them have actually met each other separately outside the program for different possibilities and different projects because i got to know about this when i did their one on ones that uh, you know in the background they are now sort of trying to do things with each other and uh, they are moving forward on that so this aspect of partnerships with their immediate group, you know, uh, is something that they're really now looking at seriously, which will actually build build up their skills in the long term in terms of how you can start with the you know the the people around you and then sort of uh, expand beyond that. I think a lot of what they're being given are the sort of foundations for. Um, for moving forward and everything won't be achieved like you say during the the term of the course Um, but it's certainly skills that they can use for the future and perhaps partnerships that they can develop in the future. So yes we we did have Matt who was uh, looking to start a cafe when he joined the program and uh, during the program itself he was able to successfully start the cafe at his garden centre was able to take the bookings, you know, get some volunteers involved. And, uh, you know, with that success, he was able to also deal with the challenges of, um, you know, how to keep the volunteers involved on an ongoing basis, you know, learn more about it and feel more confident about how he can keep doing that and grow it over a period of time. So I think 
all of that is totally new through the program. He was not uh, you know, doing any of that before he joined the program. And through our support, I think he has learned some new things and he's still working on many other bits that he uh, can to, to grow the cafe or the entire garden center uh, you know, beyond where it is right now. So that includes, let's say, online presence, selling online. He recently told me he has also started deliveries that he was not doing before. So all these things came out through, you know, discussions that we had through, let's say, business review panels or, you know, one-on-ones or general chats. And he has been able to just go out and now do those things in reality. So that is great. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds fantastic. It'll be in really interesting to watch how that develops further as well. And, and that's the urban garden that's based in the centre of Bath in Victoria Park. Um, that's That's great. Well, thank you very much for talking to me today, Sunil, and um, I wish you success with the rest of the programme and um, whatever you go on to next. Yeah, who knows? Something more with SSC. <laughs> you never know. Jim, have you got some poetry that you'd like to share with us? Yes, I do. This poem is called Celestial Crossroads. In the celestial port of the soul, at the crossroads between life and death. Or is this just a dream? She waits content as a sadhu for the good ship Imamu, which rides the mystical winds beyond the outer limits of mortal ken, over the edge of the verse, bound for the underworld, translating all souls who transcend the crossroads into pure mystery. As she contemplates her imminent ride, Ticket touts pitch her cruises at cutthroat prices, regaling her with seductive tales of exotic pleasures and treasures to be plucked at her leisure on the high seas of the verse. But her heart is as immovable as the great sky by passing clouds, or a hungry lion by the pleading of a doe-eyed gazelle. So they flip the script and tell her she's in immense danger. Better come with us, girl. You need to evacuate immediately. Don't you know there's pirates out here roaming the verse, looking for suckers to rob and murder? Curse their black hearts all you want, they'll just laugh and stuff you in a hearse. A sacrifice to their evil pantheon who, jealous of humans, revel in your misery. But why, you ask? Because you're blessed with short, mortal lives, which pushes the wise to live each day like it's their last, imbuing all experiences with blissful intensity, like lovers fated to part forever come dawn. So what you say, hun? Seize the day and have fun? The best cons contain a kernel of truth, but would you trade true love for a pot of gold, or happy freedom for false security? Imamu has anchored itself to her heart with a silent song through a multifluicity of indefinices leaving I and I utterly loneless. A song of lightning on dark nights of the soul, striking brave hearts who weather forlorn storms to burn down those low-down dirty blues. The ancestors live in that silent song of love, an immortal chorus extending beyond the horizon, reminding her we're all links in an un- broken chain, empowering us to be the calm center of the inevitable storms we must face as we sail upon life's mysterious waters, birthed by the unfathomable, birthed in sovereignty, bound for the unknown. To all with the imminent desire for humankind's healing, who dream of a world filled with joyful beings living in harmony, rather than sleepwalking through a half-life, zombies too brain-dead to think for ourselves, and too heart-dead to do what makes us happy. May we all have the patience of pregnant mothers as we wait at the crossroads of the soul. I think I'd just like to say thank you to everybody who's taken part in today's session. I hope you've really enjoyed listening to this podcast.